Now, you know, it's Palm Sunday weekend, and so I wanted to talk to you about Palm Sunday and about something related to the events of Palm Sunday. And as I was studying Palm Sunday and the events of the story, it occurred to me that as followers of Christ, I believe one of the greatest needs that we have is to see people in our world not the way Madison Avenue sees them, not the way Nike sees them, not the way Budweiser commercials present them, but rather seeing people in our world through the eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's what I want to talk to you uh, about this Palm Sunday weekend. Are we ready? Yes. We're good. All right, here we go. We're in Luke chapter 19, just a tiny bit of background. Remember that Palm Sunday marks the beginning of Jesus' last week here on earth. Five days from, the, from Palm Sunday, uh, Jesus dies on the cross. Seven days from Palm Sunday, Jesus rises from the dead. Praise the Lord. Yeah, that's great. But that's Easter. That's next week. We'll talk about that. This week, we're going back a week before that to talk about Palm Sunday. So here we go, uh, Luke chapter 19, verse 28. And after Jesus had spoken these words, he went up towards Jerusalem. And as he approached Bethany, now who lived at Bethany? Do you remember? Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. That's right. As he approached Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, stop for a second, let me show you a map, so you'll see how Jesus was coming into Jerusalem. He was coming from the east, he was going through the little town of Bethany, cresting over the top of the Mount of Olives, and going down through the Kidron Valley, and coming into Jerusalem, okay? As this happened, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and you will find a young donkey tied there, upon which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it to me. So the disciples went and found the donkey just as the Lord had said. And they brought it to Jesus and threw their cloaks on the donkey, and then they put Jesus on it. And as Jesus rode along, People spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds were shouting, Hosanna to the Messiah! Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, we often refer to this event as Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. You say, but wait a minute, Alon, I got a question. My question is, why a donkey? I mean, John Wayne, the Lone Ranger, uh, Clint Eastwood, none of these people ever rode a donkey. Well, that's right. But you see, in ancient Israel, things were different. We think of a donkey as a lowly animal, but in ancient Israel, a donkey was a royal animal. For example... In 1 Kings chapter 1, when David decided to crown his son, Solomon, as the next king of Israel, the Bible says that David sat Solomon on his personal donkey and led him through the streets of Jerusalem, proclaiming his coronation. So putting Jesus on a donkey makes all the sense in the world at the time of Christ. However, there's actually a bigger question here that we should be asking, and that question is why did Jesus ride this donkey at all? I mean, why didn't he just keep walking into Jerusalem like he'd been doing up to this point? Well, friends, the Bible answers that. Matthew chapter 21, verse 4 says, This took place. What took place? Well, Jesus riding on the donkey, yeah. This took place, watch now, to fulfill what the prophet Zechariah had said 450 years before. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, 
he said, say to the people of Israel, see, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey. There you go. Jesus did this, friends, to fulfill one of the greatest messianic prophecies in all of the Old Testament. So, here Jesus is, riding on a donkey, presenting himself to the people of Israel as, as the Messiah, exactly the way the Old Testament says. All the crowds were cheering. The pageantry was everywhere. He was uh, looking at a stunning panorama as he came over the Mount of Olives. Let's show you what it looks like today, looking down on the Temple Mount and the mosques that are there. But Jesus wasn't seeing those mosques. What he was seeing was the great temple of, uh, 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 of God. Here's a picture. One of the most impressive buildings ever built. And with all of this going on, you'd have thought that Jesus would have turned to Peter and said, Hey, Peter, <laughs> you know what, friend? It don't get no better than this. But that is not what happened. The Bible says... As Jesus approached Jerusalem and he saw the city, he wept. Literally, in the Greek New Testament, he sobbed over it, saying, If only you had known on this day, you people of Jerusalem, what would bring you peace? But now it is hidden from your eyes. There on the Mount of Olives, Jesus looked beyond all the outward beauty in front of him. He looked beyond all the pageantry around him, and he saw something else. What he saw was a city full of people with no peace, a city full of people that were hurting and broken and lonely on the inside. They had no peace about how things were going right now in this life, and they had no peace about how things were going to go in the next life, and yet he saw a city who was who, uh, full of people that were so spiritually blind that they were rejecting the only person who could give them that peace. And who was that? Him, exactly. But you know, Jesus saw something else that day. He also saw the terrible judgment that God was going to send upon the people of Jerusalem because of their rejection of him as their Messiah. Look what he goes on to say. He said, the days are coming when your enemies will encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you and your children to the ground and they will not leave one stone upon another because, here's why, you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. And what does he mean by that? Well, he means his own coming. God sent you the Messiah. Here I am. And you didn't recognize it and refused to recognize it. And you know, history tells us that 35 years later, the Jews revolted against the Roman Empire in 66 AD. And that in response, Roman Emperor Nero sent four Roman legions to Jerusalem they, just like Jesus predicted, they surrounded the city, they besieged the city, they captured the city, and then in 70 AD, they completely destroyed the city, killing, according to Josephus, uh, a historian who was there at the time recording the events, killing 1.1 million Jews, the Romans did and exporting 90,000 others into slavery. And you know, because Jesus was God himself, he knew this was coming. Because Jesus was God in the flesh, he also knew that all these dead Jewish people, 1.1 million, who would die rejecting him as their Messiah, he knew they were going to end up separated from God forever, in torment, and in agony, in hell, forever. And so, gripped by the tragedy of all of this, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives 
and he wept. You say, well, Lon, listen. If Jesus loved these people so much, if Jesus cared about these people so much, then why didn't he just give them a second chance? What? Are you serious? Folks, Jesus has been giving these people a second chance for the last three years of his public ministry. He's been healing people. He, he, he's been doing miracles. He's been raising people from the dead. He's been walking on water. He, he's been turning water into wine. And all the time calling on people to believe in him and recognize that he's the Messiah. And then after he rose from the dead, he gave these same people 35 years of more second chances with Peter and James and John and Matthew and the whole early church preaching the gospel every single day in Jerusalem for 35 years. Hey, listen, don't you ever think that God is not the God of the second chance. No. Friends, God is the God of the 500th chance. But, look here now, look at me. Sometimes, eventually, God's patience runs out. Just like it did for these Jewish people in 70 AD. Now listen, if you're here and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal savior, you've never committed your heart, your soul, and your eternal destiny to him. You've never traded in everything you've ever trusted to get you to heaven, your own good works, your own religious activity, and instead placed your trust in what Jesus did for you on the cross, shedding his blood to pay for your sin and my sin. If you've never done that, my friend, then I'm here to urge you, I'm here to beg you, that if you're sitting here listening to me today, God is giving you another second chance, or third chance, or fifth chance, or a hundredth chance. I don't know, but you're getting another chance, because you can do it today. And I want to urge you, gosh, I don't even know how to say it strong enough, friends, sooner or later, and you don't know where it is, and I don't know when it is, but sooner or later, God's patience with you is going to run out. And then you're going to face judgment just like these Jews did. I'm begging you, don't do that. Don't push God's patience. Today you can accept Christ right where you sit. You say, well, I don't really know how, Alon, to do that. Ooh, that's okay. I got something for you. Yeah. We got a class called Christianity 101. It starts meeting right after Easter. It's six weeks right here. Right while you're already here. You go to class for an hour before or after the service you come to. And we'll explain to you from the Bible exactly what it means to believe in Jesus. Exactly what it means to give your heart to him. So that biblically you understand it. And you say, well I'm not even from the area. Ooh, it's okay. We have it online. Mm -hmm. And you can take it online. I don't care if you live on the Aleutian Islands, you can take this course. So though there is no excuse for you to say, I don't understand what I need to do in order to give my heart to Christ and make him my Messiah. Don't you dare say that. Friend, take advantage of this chance that God has given you again and do it. Learn the lesson of Palm Sunday for these Jewish people, okay? Please, I beg you. Amen? All right. Now, that's as far as we want to go in our passage on Palm Sunday, but we want to ask now our most important question, and we know what that is, yes? And I know you've, you've missed this, yes? I know you have. Uh-huh. Okay, so you ready? All right, here we go now, nice and loud. One, Two, three. Oh, oh, how sweet it is. Isn't that great? I missed that. Yeah. You say, Lon, I, you know, I appreciate what you're saying. I understand about Palm Sunday. I understand why Jesus wept. 
but I just don't see what it's got to do with me. Well, let's talk about that as we close. You know, the Bible tells us that during his earthly life, Jesus only wept twice that the Bible records. Number one, he wept in John chapter 11 at the tomb of his good friend Lazarus, who lived in Bethany, as he, as he was gripped by the pain and the loss of human death. And the only other place was here in Luke chapter 19, overlooking Jerusalem, where Jesus was gripped by the blindness and the eternal damnation of people outside of Christ. And so this week, as I was studying this passage, I asked myself the question, I'd like to ask you to think about it. If Jesus were to show up here in Washington, D.C. today, what would he do? Well, I don't know what you think he might do, but based on Luke chapter 19, I'll tell you what I think he, he would do. I think he would do precisely what he did 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem. I think he would look past all of our monuments and all of our memorials and all of our museums. I think he would look past all of the power in this town and the money in this town and the influence in this town. And I think he would see thousands upon thousands upon thousands of lost people who desperately need him. But people who are so spiritually blind that they don't even realize it. And people who are so spiritually hardened that they don't even care about it. And I think Jesus would sit on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. I think Jesus would sit at the fountain at DuPont Circle. I think Jesus would sit in the terminal at BWI. I think Jesus would sit on a bench at Tyson's Corner Mall. And he would weep. And if you as a follower of Christ, walked by and were to see Jesus sitting there weeping. And if you were to sit down next to him and put your arm around him and try to console him as he wept, I think Jesus would look up at you and me with eyes red from weeping. And with a very sad voice, I believe he would say to you and me, why aren't you weeping? Why aren't you weeping? Because if you saw people in this town the way I see them, you'd be weeping too. William Carey was an Englishman born in 1761. He was a shoemaker. He was a wonderful follower of Christ as a young man. And in his young 20s, he borrowed a copy of the book Voyages, written by, by Captain James Cook. And as he read the book, William Carey became infatuated and fascinated by the description of all the beauty that's in the book of places like Hawaii and Tahiti and the South Sea Islands where Captain Cook sailed. But then he came to a place where Captain Cook tells about an island that he and his crew set up a huge wooden cross on a cliff at the top of the island, but they never tell the, told the natives what the cross meant because they couldn't speak the language. And that night, William Carey had a dream, more like a nightmare, really. He dreamed that he saw natives in his dream, the natives on that island, walking right past that wooden cross and falling off the cliff and into the fires of hell because they didn't know what the cross meant. And he woke up in a cold sweat and he said, somebody's got to go tell those people what that cross means. So we went to the Baptist Ministers Association. He was a Baptist. And he brought this up. And the chairman of, of this ministerial meeting said to him, and I quote, Sit down, young man. When God chooses to convert the heathen, 
He'll do, he'll do it without your help or ours, end of quote. But Carey couldn't give up. He wouldn't give up. And finally, in 1792, he formed the first modern foreign missionary society, the Baptist Missionary Society of England. And guess who its very first missionary was? Take a guess. William Carey. That's exactly right. And do you know this is the beginning of the modern missionary movement that you and I think of today. All the missionaries that are out around the world today, all the missions organizations that are around the world today, every missionary who's ever served over the last 250 years as a missionary, all can trace their aegis back to the Baptist Missionary Society of England and William Carey. His biographer said, and I quote, the Christian church owes more to William Carey than to any other man since the Apostle Paul. End of quote. Wow. Now what really happened here, folks, with William Carey? Well, it's not very complicated. What happened is that one follower of Jesus, William Carey, began to see the South Sea Islands not like Captain Cook saw them, but he began to see them like Jesus saw them. And my friends, as 21st century followers of Christ, I believe that this is the great need of the hour for the church. That this is the call of Palm Sunday upon the church and upon our lives as individuals for us to see our world like Jesus sees it. For us to see the gazillions of lost people around us who desperately need Jesus Christ. More than they need money, more than they need power, more than they need fame, more than they need anything. And then, once we've begun to see this, to ask ourselves the question, well then, what am I prepared to do about it? See, William Carey, what made him special is he was prepared to do something about it. So how about you and me? What are we prepared to do about it? Let's bow our heads together. And with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, here's what I'd like to ask you to do, please. I'd like to ask you to think about people that you know, people you care about, who desperately need the Lord. Maybe it's a mom or a dad. Maybe it's a child or a grandchild, a brother or a sister. Maybe it's a friend at school or a friend at work, or someone in the neighborhood, doesn't matter. But they desperately need Christ. Okay, you got them? Now, I want you to take a moment, and I want you to tell God what you are prepared to do about it. Are you prepared to pray for them? Are you prepared to speak to them? Are you prepared to weep for their souls before God as long as there's breath in your body or their body? What are you prepared to do? You take a moment and, and you tell God. Lord, may the truth of your word compel us to action today. May it compel us to overcome our embarrassment, our, our, our tenuousness. May it 
compel us to overcome our busyness and reach out to people who need the Lord. Lord, speak to us deeply that we might see the people around us like you do.